Hey there, everybody. My name is Shane. I, I run the events over at 10 Capital Network. We have another great event for you today on how to close an investor. Great presentation and uh, a great couple of founders after that who are going to tell you more about what they're doing. Uh, if you have any questions during the session, you can go ahead and put them in our chat box. Um, it's activated and ready to go. So we'd love to hear from you uh, in the audience. And uh, with that, I'm going to pass it off to Hall, our CEO, to get things kicked off. Thanks, Shane. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. We've got a great event. Well, today we have with us Sal Busimi of the Harlem River Navy. I've had Sal on my podcast, and we had a really great time talking about all things fundraising. And Sal's an expert at fundraising and said, well, we have to have you come on and talk to our audience about this. So with that, we invited Sal to come out. And today he's going to share with you his tips and techniques for how to close an investor. And I know for many of our startups and even our investors, they're looking for those tips and techniques as well. If you have questions along the way, go ahead and put them in the chat box. We'll do our best to answer those. And then afterwards, we have two great startups that we want to show you as well. So with that, let me go and bring Sal up and have Sal talk about his background and what he did to get into the role he is in today. Sal, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Hal. Thank you for the encore presentation. I really do appreciate it. Um, I have been, for the past almost 25 years, been um, working in financial services, but that's taken different types of roads. I started my career at Goldman Sachs in the investment banking division in 1998. And then at the age of 29, I raised $30 million for um, buying distressed loans from Bear Stearns. So that was the first time I managed my own institutional um, balance sheet, if you will. And then I did it again with another partner of mine who's our general counsel to this day. And I was living out West at the time. And that was where it was a lot of default that was out there. And I actually got the idea from my ex-boss, who was the former treasury secretary. He went out West um, to buy IndyMac. And I was buying a lot of what we call these defaulted hard money loan um, you know, funds. And they were basically very mismanaged. They were um, you know, people were not investing the proper, you know, loan to values or anything. And we made some money off of that because a lot of it was distressed. I wrote my second book at that point called Raising Real Money, Real Estate Funds Uncovered uh, for people who are interested in that stuff. However, the other aspect to that is in 2013, I wound up getting outbid by a bunch of people who were doctors and dentists. And what they were doing is, is that they were buying what we call necessity retail. And I pulled together um, millions of dollars tens of millions of dollars to be able to, to buy these for cash. And I was outbid and I gave the money back. And what happened was, is that a lot of the families that I gave the money back to, some of them were life science families. And they said, Sal, you know, you've done so well in real estate. Why don't you put your guns towards us and see if we can work together? And that's how Harlem River Navy was actually created is because it's my two other partners who all have equal pedigree, um, similar to mine, if not better. My one partner, Albert Yu, and he was managing six billion dollars for the Rockefeller family office, not the broker dealer back in, you know, back at the age of 26 um, in their life sciences group. And my other partner, he uh, has done the same thing for the state of Texas um, pension, managing their life sciences venture. So there's a lot of pedigree there that we were able to do that. And one of the things that we found out is that, um, and this is how we we put it together, is that a lot of these real estate families hall have a gateway drug to life sciences. And it's called philanthropy. And that philanthropy is usually very expensive, poorly run, and you know, almost invested on emotion. And when our families found out, our real estate families, that they could invest alongside us in the same way in our deals that are world class, um, and they knew where the money was going and you know, had much lower expense ratios, like 100 cents on the dollar was going towards the what we call direct private investment, people were very, uh, very encouraged by that. And we now have about 20 names under our belt. All of them are doing really well. We've had one hiccup, um, but you know, in private equity, you can sort of roll things into another, but we make private direct investments. And I have to say like, you know, it's, it's the quality of the deals that we get into and it sort of expands the network. And that's sort of the spice of life too. I was telling Paul not too long ago that uh, one of the deals that we have invested into called Thrive Bioscience is um, led by a world-class CEO, a founder. It's gonna be his 15th exit and his eighth unicorn. And we're very proud. We have about $2.5 million you know, allocated into that, invested into it. Um, all of our CEOs have had multiple exits. But the other thing too, which is really telling is that they all have world-class multifamily or single family offices as lead investors into all of these deals, which means it's not like, you know, when you look at a capitalization table, sometimes you see like $5,000, $10,000. These are millions of dollars that are being 
um, placed into these um, into these opportunities. And because what these families really want is some sort of a legacy, right? That's really what it is. It's like they have the discretionary income to build a legacy, and that's done pretty well. And we're going to be pivoting into other things um, soon. We uh, you know, we are pretty strong in life sciences. We did do some AI stuff last year. We invested in a company called AI Scout, which you'll be hearing about um, during the fall, probably more popular than Bud Light actually during the football season. Um, and the reason is because it's, if you have a camera and a phone and you can do a few moves, you can quartile yourself. And it's easy, it's very interesting uh, because it's already been very successfully used as technology and East India to bring people over to Britain to play in professional sports leagues. So we are, we're, we're community focused. We're a cabal of about 20 families, um, very, very, very um, active, very engaged. And uh, our motto is interactivity is the new currency. So we're always, if you're on my email list, you're getting emails from me. Um, you're getting notifications. We're always inviting our CEOs to come in and talk. I used to write these long letters, but nobody read them. So I'm not writing them anymore. I'm just going to have them, you know, come from the horse's mouth itself. But that also adds a tremendous amount of credibility too, you know, for the capital raising. So, um, you know, we've had we've had a lot of success doing this. We've been very smart, and it probably comes down to one thing, Hall, and and really what it is is the power of your network. And if you have a strong network, you're going to be doing well. If you have a strong network in what we call buy side finance, uh, you know, venture capital, private equity, investment banking, you're going to see some great deals. If you are, you know, if you live, for example, in, um, you know, Austin, Texas, you're not going to see as good quality deals, you know, because it's just, it's a different world down there. It's not as financially focused and oriented. And there's people who pay a lot of money to go to these clubs to be able to see, you know, great deal flow. But considering uh, myself and my partner's reputation in the industry for doing what we say we're going to do, not to mention with a, you know, very successful track record on that, it actually comes together quite well, and that builds a story in and of itself. I appreciate the background there and where you came from and what you're currently working on and so forth. You know, the topic we have today and what we talked about on the podcast was how do you close an investor? And just wanted to get uh, jump into that because I think we'll have a lot of questions from the audience there as well. What are, you, what are you seeing out there as best practices for doing that? You know, so I just recently moved to Miami. And during Miami, there was a before Silicon Valley blew up. There were all these tech entrepreneurs who came all over the, from San Francisco or Austin, and they just moved to Miami. And the ecosystem was pretty vibrant until Silicon Valley Bank collapsed. And what, what it was is, and even before then, is that you saw that there was a lot of cheap, easy money that was floating around. And that gave us the crypto bubble, that gave us um, some technology bubble, if you will, a lot of, you know, maybe not stronger businesses with you know, experienced operators might have gotten blown out because, you know, they couldn't navigate it. They didn't have a network to, to sort of deal or circumvent that. However, um, what, what people and I, it's interesting because I was coaching one guy over a cup of coffee. His name's Andrew Satz. And he, he had this wonderful presentation. And at the end, he sounded like something out of Shark Tank, right? And that's not real life. And it actually made me put together this guide here called Calling the Capital, which is very interesting. And one of the things that um, I told him to do was to change a few things in his script. But what people don't do is that when they're raising money is that you have to understand that this is a relational business. Just because somebody's rich and you know they're rich doesn't necessarily mean they want to um, invest in your company. And, and they they lack the bedside manners because they're actually going out and they're you know being a little too transactional. You know what I mean? For transactional. And that's, that's I think, a result of like the Kramerification of America on CNBC, the um, you know, the crypto, you know, people getting into your DMs, trying to sell you stuff like it became people just got that hustle, that Gary V vibe, if you will. But that doesn't really translate to people who are higher net worth, who either inherit it and they're scared the death of screwing it up, which I wrote about in my third book, Investing Legacy, I brought show and tell, or um, first generation that knew how hard it was to get there in the first place. And they don't want to lose it again, right? This could be a guy in his 60s. He's not looking to bet all in on crypto. And you have to really cater to, um, you know, the, 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 the word that they use is emotion, but we always talk about status, right? Look, if you invest in this company, you'll be able to tell your friends you invested in this. If you invest in this class A industrial, we have a video that says, here's what you've invested into. People like that. They bias towards quality. And if you can make it so that people are very, very proud to be investing into your company for some reason, it'll really, really work out. And, you know, I can put together many, I can talk about some of those um, strategies that we put together that people can use to raise money for it. But I think you have to think about it as, look, this is relational. I mean, I've been courting this one 
family that we'd be talking about to, not a family, but this one, this one gentleman that we were talking about for a million dollars for four months uh, before he came in. And he's a professional investor, right? And he, and, and, you know, he knows quality, but you have to make sure that you, you know, people are investing not in the deal. They never really know about the deal to them. It's just, you know, they, 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 you know, they just, they're looking at you, they're judging you and they're saying, does this person have the determination and grit to do what needs to be done after coming out of the, you know, every day when I wake up coming out of bed, that's really what, what people need to do. And you, when we talk to a lot of investors, one of the things we like to talk to them about is, Hey, look, if you, you know, if you get into this, well, you know, we put all sorts of bonuses and stacks, for example, for thrive bioscience, which I was telling you about, all of our um, investors are going to be getting Patagonia fleeces, right? That says Thrive Bioscience. They want that stuff because now they're going around to their ski resort next summer or whatever saying, hey, you know, this is, or wherever they live, maybe at most of them are in New England, you know, where that's like a staple to them, that's like a status symbol, right? And they're like, huh, that's interesting. It sort of pushes it over the top a little bit sometimes for these people to do this. Funny story too, just to get off tangent a little bit is um, everybody's aware of how um, pro- football works over overseas and one of the families that invested into this company called AI Scout um, was the new owner of Chelsea Football Club who bought it from uh, Abramovich and what what I needed to do in order to close this very quickly because we had a million dollar slug that we could invest into was that I needed a way to compel these people to write the check faster, right? Or just get the due diligence faster. That's why I wanted them to get to the data room of the documents. I said the data room of the documents and I watched that through HubSpot. And I actually had an idea and I said, what if I got each investor an autographed jersey by the entire Burnley Football Club? And sure enough, we were able to do that. And that brought in, we were oversubscribed at that point. So it's the little things that you do to cater to your investors' needs and wants that really put them over the edge sometimes besides the numbers and everything. And of course, the deal has to pencil out as well. Great. So how do you create urgency in a fundraise? It just seems like it takes a long time to get people you know, moving on it. What can you do to kind of spark that uh, interest to get it done now rather than later, in it, addition to the swag you talked about? I, yeah, I think the problem is that everybody puts something on there and they don't really understand who's supposed to be leading the dance. This is your this is if you're a founder, if you're uh, an investment manager, a real estate syndicator, you control this, right? you control the terms. I think sometimes they let the investors control that. And every time I see this, and even in like open-ended funds, which are technically open-ended, don't have any deadlines, you can get creative there. But for real estate and founders, what I like to do is I like to, I like to use deadlines. And I can tell you how many pitch books I've seen where there's no deadline. It's just the date, you know, which is dated already. It goes, you know, it's like, here's my presentation. It's what June right now, you'll see it's like from like, you know, December 2022, <laughs> they haven't updated. That's one red flag. But even then it says, well, you're not really serious about it, but you have to compel them for a reason. And, for, and you always have to start out with a deadline. Nobody ever uses a deadline. It's really, you know, the first rule of negotiation is to use a, a deadline and nobody really thinks to do that. And it's kind of, you know, it's really interesting because every time I see a deck or something, I never know what happens next. Nobody tells them the call to action. If you want to invest, first tranche closes July, you know, July 1st. After that, you don't get as much. And what you do is then we get into another strategy that you do on top of that and you tranche it, right? So, oh, Hal, sorry, you couldn't make it in the first tranche. Anyway, you can still invest, but you're not getting the same warrants and the discount that the first tranche people have gotten, but you can still invest. And by the way, you're not going to get the Patagonia vest either with a company name on it, but at least you can tell people you're involved into this deal. And now all of a sudden like, oh, no, 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 hold on, hold on. And of course you put them in, you know, at, at some point you don't want to like, um, you know, have them abuse you, but you always put them into the first tranche, but you have to stack it so that all the goodies are up front for them to move fast rather than later on down the line. Does that make sense? Absolutely. You mentioned warrants. How do you, how would you use warrants in a fundraise to move things along? Well, I mean, you can offer people what, what just going off on that a little bit, I've been offered to, uh, advisor shares um, for being much more active with the company. And what you can do is you can actually, if you have a, you know, if you have a, your documents put together and talk to your lawyer about this, of course, is that you can actually award certain warrants upon certain thresholds or discount 
for example, of this, you know, of the current price. And so, you know, with, with example of Thrive, I think we got like a 37 and a half percent discount because we were able to come in way over, you know, what we were supposed to do. You have to build the incentive somehow because everybody has a greed gene. Everybody expresses it differently, Hal, but they all have the greed gene. That's great. What other incentives have you seen people put out there aside from warrants and swag itself? Is there, you talk about advisor shares, is that mm -hmm. something you do just very specifically, or is that something you do for everybody that comes you in? You know, a you time do it frame? specifically. So you have your board of managers, right? And you know, that's your that's your management board, and your board is really for your company should be the best and the brightest of the people you can find in your industry. And that would be, you know, I say that your your cap table is your company's soul, but your um, you know your board of managers, if you will, your management team, your board, they are your conscience. And so what you could do is you can have a other set of people who legally aren't able to do anything. They're just figureheads, but you can tell them that we'll make you, you know, add you to the board of advisors. And if you come in for a million dollars, we can give you an extra, you know, 10,000 warrants or something like that or founder shares. Great, great. You know, what about creating scarcity? It seems like there's so much. Uh, oh, yeah. I wrote stock that. Hold on. left so, available yeah, so there. How do you put the scarcity angle on this thing? scarcity angle comes in many different ways i think the scarcity number one is is that there's there's three different types of scarcity right so there's supply related scarcity if you were to go in and try to invest in spacex today you would not be able to get into it because it's very supply constricted elon knows exactly who owns those shares and he wants to give you a financial ectomy for any buyer going into it don't ask me how i know this but just take my word for it okay so that's supply there's only so much supply then there's the time-related scarcity. The time-related scarcity is what we talked about that people never use, and that's deadlines, right? If you're not using deadlines, then you're dead in the water because nobody's going to have any incentive to take action whatsoever when anything happens. So you have to use the deadline. But you can also use two deadlines. So now we're stacking the activities together, the strategy. So you have a deadline. Now you have two deadlines. Deadline for tranche one, deadline for tranche two, whatever that is. And then the other thing, too, is demand-related scarcity. And demand-related scarcity is when you can continue to tell your investors, look, we only have a million, we're just going to talk in whole numbers here. For AI Scout, we had a um, million-dollar allocation that we were able to invest into. After five days, I sent an email out saying, look, we have 800 of the 200, you know, we have 800 of the million out. We need only one investor for $200,000. We got four more investors for $200,000 because we were able to show them legally and credibly that we were oversubscribed and we were, but that's what it is. When people start seeing that other people are jumping in, there's a dogpiling effect that happens and that has much more power um, to anything that you can, you know, you can talk about. The other thing too, is that when the other, I, I would also mention in like name brand investors, if you have name brand investors who are leading these rounds or something, you want to mention that you want to drop it. And again, I wrote this in this 24 page guide called callingthecapital.com. You can go to callingthecapital.com and, and just stack either one of the 20. They all help, but there's a lot of ideas that we've used to do this, but you really need to make sure that you communicate to your investors consistently. Hence, I said, you know, interactivity is the new currency where this is what's going on today. Here's what's happening. We have, you know, since we sent this second email out, we have, you know, two people who actually got back to us and said they want in and the documents are sitting right there. The moment they sign the LPA, the limited partnership agreement, it's it's legal binding. So these people understand mm -hmm. it, but they also see other people following in. And, and to them, that demand is really what they really want to get into. It's the fear of missing out. Um, but the proper way people say it on Wall Street is oversubscribed. Great. Uh, well, a quick question from the audience is, how do they get on your email list? You can send me an email at, uh, actually follow me. Yeah, send me an email at sal at hrn.llc. I'll put it on here. You put that in the chat box, that'll help people. Yeah. And anybody in the audience, if you want to follow what Sal's doing, yeah. just sign up for that email and get on the mailing list and you'll find we'll a lot put, of great information out of it. Uh, yep. My next question is, I, I hear a lot of investors say, hey, I want to invest in your startup. I need to do my diligence. But then they don't start the diligence process. What do you do to move that along? Well, I mean, here's the other question is what gives them, I mean, it depends on the investor. Now, if it's a mom and pop investor and they haven't done their due diligence, they're not going to because they don't know how to. So you got to find out who are they leaning on for Intel, for diligence. And I would say, okay, so you are a anesthesiologist. What do you know about AI? And right. And so they'll be like, I don't, it's my brother-in-law. And this is where you start to understand, okay, well, does your brother-in-law have any investing experience? 
Well, no, he sells mutual funds at Raymond James. Okay, is that guy really qualified to be doing that type of due diligence? Does he know anything about this? Because all he knows is the series and how to sell things you know, that are liquid or stocks, right? So you have to ask the hard questions when somebody says that and reframe it. Because you always want to know who, you know, they're not going to do it themselves. They're not going to sit there and learn your entire business if they, um, you know, if they're working or if they're not working, they're more focused on other things like maybe, you know, they're retired, they have grandkids or something. You got to ask them the hard questions and say, all right, Hall, who does this due diligence for you? Is it you? And you'd be like, oh, no, no, no. You know, I, it's my buddy, you know, John and John's my buddy. We used to play football together in the frat house and everything and, you know. And uh, he sells mutual funds. He does really well. All right. Does he know anything about alternative, you know, alternative until AI or, or anything like that? Well, not really, but okay. So, you know, now you got a guy that got a guy or whatever, that's what you want to avoid and be like, look, for the amount of money you're investing into this, what, how much due diligence do you need to do? And then at that point, they're like, well, you know, you'll find out later. They'll say, all right, just send the docs. Great. You know, I, I see a lot of first time angel investors who know they're supposed to do diligence, but they don't know quite what that means. They don't even know to ask for a diligence box or a data room. And so one of the techniques I come up with is I say, well, let's let me show you where everything is in my diligence box. And you have them, you walk them through it. Well, here are my entity filings or my patent filings and so forth. And along the way, yeah, they yeah, ask yeah. certain questions. And by the time you get to the end of the box, you basically have answered all their open questions and they can't yeah. really think of anything else. So we've done our diligence and we're done for the day. And when you're writing a 50K check, that's that's probably about as much diligence as going to be done anyway. And so oftentimes they just sign up the check. So if they're not going through the diligence, we can help them by walking them through the diligence box just to show them where everything is and what it looks like. Most yeah, early stage just, companies, there's about 10 documents in that diligence box. And so yep. it doesn't take long. But and a, there's, see, that's yeah. a great idea because you're using it as another presentation, another way to touch them. It's like, by the way, now we're going to do due diligence. I'm going to show you how to use due diligence. Uh, on this deal right here. And we're going to go over it together. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's one way we do it. And like I say, with early stage investors who aren't really quite sure what they need to do, uh, that, that's one way to do it. If they know what they're supposed to do, the opposite is when you talk to a VC fund and they say, okay, we're going to do diligence on it. It takes about three weeks and uh, yeah. there's only three three deals in front of you. And so mm -hmm. you're, mm -hmm. you're kind of mm -hmm. stuck there because they've got a process, but you're in the queue. It'll happen someday, but it's hard to keep your... your <laughs> It's hard to keep your schedule going. Oh, by the way, things could change from here to there. And so, yeah. uh, you, you know, it's, it's, that's one of the tougher ones to do. So I always ask the investor, okay, if we're doing diligence. Uh, what is your process? And like you say, who's, which, uh, which analyst is doing this and what, what information uh -huh. do they need? Do they have a checklist yep. or whatever? And so we're always trying to support that process as best we can. Mm -hmm. Cool. So yeah, you know, families are a lot easier to work with because funds have, there, I think, you know, and I, I don't want to get off tangent here, but I think if you look at the funds today, they've just gotten so big. I think Sequoia announced today that they're splitting into three. Right. It was either <laughs> today or last night. I, so, you know, are they really doing really well for their investors? I don't know. They sort of become like monolithic utilities to me, but that's just, you know. Well, what's your experience with family offices and doing diligence? I, I know every family office is different, but if you had to categorize it, is it? They are, uh, yeah. They intensive? Have, is you, it not intensive? It's intensive. It depends. Um, a lot of them, a family office by definition is um, a group that has liquid assets over $100 million. The reason is, is because it costs 1% of that per year just to keep it moving. And what they usually have is that they have a venture capital department. They have a philanthropy department, you know, which I was able to rob that piggy bank, um, as, you know, we talked about earlier. And then they also have like a real estate component too, as well. And what they have are usually, you know, members from the family who have, I mean, the real ones who are real, who do this the right way, uh, they'll say, you have to go work somewhere else. And then you have to go to business school before you can start working for the family office. And that's really, you know, the proper way to do it. Or what they do is they just outsource, um, you know, they'll find guys like me or my partners that have, you know, the pedigree track record, hire them to bring inside, you know, to deploy the money that way. So it's not like they're doing it themselves. They have a staff of people who are highly qualified to do it. And they are actually very competitive on salary to do so because it's not about the money to them. Although it is, it's about their brand reputation. They don't want that tarnished. They're not going to go into a crypto deal, um, you know, and embarrass themselves like Kevin O'Leary or, you know, those guys. Right. My next question is, is how do you qualify investors? Everybody's in the room looking at this and many are saying, yeah, I'm interested, but you don't quite know what. How do you separate the ones that you think are really going to move forward and do something versus those that are, are really not? What do you do for that? 
Um, I put them, I mean, for, first for me, it's body language. If they're like trying to pull away or something, that means they haven't done anything. Um, that means they're just, they're just there for the free brownies or the beer or the cap, you know, the happy hour and everything. And that's usually your lower tier ones. But I just start asking the questions, but not in a very interrogative way, but in a very passive way. Like what, have you invested in a, in a private placement before? How did that go? How did you get that? You know, where did, where did you source that deal from? Uh, and then, you know, what are the size checks that you write? You always want to be direct. What are the size checks? Where is this capital coming from? You know, this is, you know, is this your capital or is this, you know, someone else's? Are you pooling it together? Or do you have to go out and call it? You know, have you ever done this before? <laughs> right? You know, you want to stay away from people who are like first time trying to be capital formation guys. Um, that'll get them into trouble. What you want to do is you want to just focus on them and say, I just ask the, the, the real questions. It's like, how much have you invested before? So when you look at ticket sizes that you write for a company like mine, what would that look like? And just let them talk. You have to ask the questions and make, and, and keep the relationship going. The problem is, is that if you don't, then you know there you, 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 you might not get in contact with that guy again. So what I do is I always make sure that people, you know, I get their contact information and I follow up with them. And if they don't follow up, that's fine. I know that they're, you know, got other things to do or they got too much on their plate or maybe they're not real. But I would only take their business card only after I qualify them and say, hey, this is, you know, where's this money coming from? You know, how much do you usually, what's your average ticket size to something like this? Have you been, have you ever invested in a, in, in a private company before like this? What are your expectations on a company like this? You know, um, and, and really you want to weed out the ones who don't sound like they've been watching binge watching shark tank if that makes sense because right. they don't i don't think they have a real good grasp of reality about how you know things really work in the in the real world of venture and angel investing too well at what point in the process do you ask for that number you know are you in for 50 100 or sometimes do you start with the range and you then narrow it no, from there no 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 so i always have a minimum so the minimum is something that we have and, and you have to start out high on this is uh for thrive it's two hundred thousand dollars okay now if people are like Oh shoot, I only have 50. Well, all right, maybe we can cobble together a couple 50s with each, you know, maybe we can find some friends, but you know, the CEO really wants whole numbers here. I hope you understand, Hall. You know, I might not be able to take it. But you have to start out high because that also gives a higher perceived barrier to entry. It also shows that there's a lot more legitimacy in the offer, especially if you're working with CEOs like ours. But it also it it it's not it changes the frame of the conversation to do I want to invest to now I really want to invest because I can't get it. And do you have to sign the term sheet before they look at the diligence box just to enforce a little bit more interest and commitment to it? No, no, I don't. Okay. You ever use DocuSign or any tools like that to sign these Always. term sheets? Always. Yeah. Always. We love, we, it's a pain. Um, right now we're actually switching over to a new service, um, which is a fund administrator service. So um, they have their, not expensive, but they're not cheap either. But they're, you know, your founders don't need them unless you're managing money. They're called NAV Consulting, uh, navconsulting.net. They're based out in Chicago. And they they do all the documents and everything now. But there's software you can use. But if you're starting out, you can just do it with DocuSign um, or Adobe or anything like that. You want a digital records of everything. It's easier that way to just pull up. And um, I would also, you know, if you're doing this and you're fundraising full time and as a CEO and a founder, you should be, that's your job is to always be raising capital besides building your business. Um, and you'll learn that, you know, that people who fail always say, I wish I raised more capital. I learned how to raise more capital. That's the reason why they fail sometimes. I mean, good people who had a business that was going is that they just didn't understand that you have to light the candle at both ends or have someone that's business development for you raising capital. But you always have to be in the business of raising capital. And I would invest in a CRM so that you can send out emails to people. Because if they write you a check once, they'll probably write you a check again. Right. Well, I talked to an experienced founder once, and he said, it's always baby steps in fundraising. You never ask them to do more than one thing, but you're always asking them to do something in every call, every word. You're just moving them from one step to the next. What's your take on that? Uh, I agree. I, you know, that's why we send a lot of emails. I force them to open the emails. I for, you know, they're, they're making a micro commitment by reading the email and they know that I'm on top of them or I'm giving them good news or not good news or other news or whatever. That's what I do. I'm never asking them to do anything, you know, I, that I wouldn't ask them to do, but I would say, look, Paul, I know you've expressed a lot of interest in this. Can you come in for a hundred thousand? I can match it. I need you to come in. We're so close. That's really what it comes down to. You have to offer the number out there. If they can't do that, then it comes down. 
if you say, well, what can you put in? They're going to come up with a low ball offer that doesn't show any commitment on their end, like $10,000. I would never take anything less than $50,000 from anyone. Right. Well, one of the techniques I learned from a founder was you always capture everybody's interest or commitment in addition to their investment. And then if you add it all up, you can communicate that to the other investors saying, look, all the interest and commitment is well over our, our remaining amount. Uh, they could come in before you and start to show that, you know, there is true scarcity here. I have people that are thinking and circling at this level. What's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, that's that's fine. We're going to be doing that on Thursday with Thrive to that um <laughs> we've already had 2.5 million we need another half a million haul do you want to come in behind this number one investor you know or you know this one person that will be relinquishing i can't be we're in a tight nda but you know what i mean it's either yes or no at that point it's either yes or no it's the, that's all it is and i agree wholeheartedly what you want to do is you really want to make sure that you commit to them say look i have this soft circle these guys are going to fund soon these guys who everyone who but you also have to add a little bit of legitimacy too you have to say Look, all the guys that are soft circled here, they've already invested in at least one or two of my other deals. So I know they're going to come in. There's a reason, the certainty, certainty of execution here that they're actually going to write the check. And that's, you know, how I would improve upon that. You ever use existing investors' names as part of the pitch or you get a permission or how, how does that work? When, when do you use uh, that? We when have to ask, yeah. So that's the whole reason why tomorrow's Zoom won't be called, uh, recorded. Um, because we have to use permission, but we can't have it recorded. I do when we're talking with uh, families, they want to know who the other family offices are. And I have to say, this is, you know, we have to disclose who the other investors are, the top investors, not smaller investors, but the top investors for this, because that uh, means that they're, you know, as I said before, the cap table is the soul of the asset, right? And when you're on top of this and you're working with these, um, with, with your investors, they want that they want to know that right up front, right? They don't want to know, you know, who who's the smart ones in the family. I'm sorry, who are the smart people, the investors now who are investing into this? And are there, are there any synergies, right? So you always want like a real estate family investing with other real estate families in the real estate deals, right? I mean, that's how New York was sort of built. Um, the same thing today. You always want people that have commonality and able to provide a little bit more than just, um, cap, you know, equity capital, but also reputational and um, strategic capital too. I mean, if there's a lead investor, they usually have done substantial diligence. If you can get a copy of that, would you use that with other investors? Say the diligence is already done. It's right here. You can get access to it if you're serious about it, you know, in over 100K, something like that. Would that be a, a carrot in, or would that be a stick? Uh, that is definitely a carrot because they want to see the due diligence there. If I said that this diligence is coming from one of the larger families who has a $240 million investment into SpaceX, yeah, that's going to go far. Would you put a limit on that? You only only 100k and above can get that. 50k is you know they don't get that. Yeah, I would say I, no. Yeah, I, everything has to be sort of qualified. So for 100k, yes, you can see the diligence room. You can see everything that's there. That's how I know you're serious. But I need you to make sure you understand before I send this to you, Hall. This is very classified. If you go through this, you only have one week to go through it. I'm lifting the password off for one week. After that, you know, you know, we'll part ways as friends, and you can still get the Christmas cards. Great, great. Uh, well, what are the thoughts you have at this point about cl closing uh, the investor? What have we covered that, uh, what have we not covered yet? I think what you have to do is not be afraid to send emails out with chat GPT and everything today. You need to make sure that you're always on top of your investors. And the problem is, is that, um, as I said before, if you're not raising capital, especially of a founder in this part of the, you know, in, in this, you know, economy that we're in today, it's going to be very prohibitive for you to do that. So you might want to, at some point, spend some time really building a robust, you know, list of investors that you can actually send out to. Like you're talking to them like friends, right? I'm never going to write an email that says, dear colleague, you know, we are proud. Nobody's, who cares if you're proud or not, right? Like nobody cares that I'm <laughs> proud. I don't know why they say that or we're pleased. <laughs> yeah. So I just turned it around and said, you're, and you read my email. So you know what they, you know, how they read and what they look like. But it's a it's a function of just building that relationship with those investors and continuing to do that because every time you reach out or do something, it's money in the bank, right? And you got to think about it. It's money in the bank, and the more that you hold off without asking them for something, the easier it's going to be for you to get that. And my my last question is around the use of the phone versus email. At what point do you shift from the phone to or shift from the email to a phone call? itself which which i, take I will that? call people i mean the highest and best use of my time as a founder or as a ceo is being on the phone call talking to the investors texting them 
I was texting him from the treadmill this morning. You know, I do my walk for 30, 60 minutes. I listen to a podcast and I call them and say, hey, I don't have much time. I'm on the treadmill. Like, oh, okay, okay. You got, are you going to go into the steel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Can I have it by Friday? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. I'll look forward to Friday. So, you know, I'm always talking to them. Remember, this is a relational business. I'd even text them too. You know, we text, we talk. Um, you know, you can treat these people like they're humans. Well, I find it funny because I've been in business for many years and it used to be that you could call anybody on the phone that you want any time of day or night, but to email, you had to have permission. Today's world, you can email anybody you want anytime, but you have to have permission to call them on the phone. That seems uh -huh. to be the, the going rate right now. Uh, what's your take? What's your, what do you tell a founder who says, I don't have permission to call them on the phone? I mean, how, do they have a relationship with these people? Well, maybe that's part of the process is you're building a relationship along <laughs> or the way. It's just a yeah. spam call. Like, I, you know, I'm Hall and I'm, you know, want you to invest in my latest technology venture. I think that's, I mean, that is to me, I don't think you're going to get anywhere with that. But that's, I mean, yeah, if, I can call anyone I want if they're, you know, I, provided I have a relationship with them. I'm not, you know, there are people I meet at conferences and I said, you know, I'll call them up real quick. But, or, you know, I'll just set up a call with them at some point. But usually it doesn't, it's not that I'm calling them out of the blue. It's just, hey, here's a text message. I have someone I want you to meet. I have this, I think this is going to be an excellent opportunity for us uh, to do something together. When can you talk? And then, you know, just have my assistant set it up. It's easier that way. Well, typically they, they've had a call before and they've actually pitched and they've gone through and there's some discussion, but so they emailed back. back and they haven't gotten a response. And I'll so now we're, now we're trying to figure out how to break the, the log jam. Call them back. Always get on the telephone. Always get on the telephone. If you can okay. get on the telephone, always do it. Yeah. If you've already pitched to them and you have their information and they spent their time with you, then yeah, of course, that you're entitled to that. Remember, nobody's going to invest in you without giving you their time first. Right. Well, one thing I coach people on is when you do that first pitch, ask permission to keep them up to date on what's going on. And almost everybody says yes, because they want to you know, learn more and see how it plays out. And so you, you get permission at that time and then move into a phone call thereafter to build a relationship. I find it's easy, much easier to build a relationship on the phone than it is on email. So at some point you have to move to phone to build that relationship. Always. Oh, wait. nobody's going to write a $50,000, $100,000 check just over email. They want to talk to you on the telephone. They want right. to feel when, when I was, um, so during the pandemic, we were supposed to, uh, we were supposed to go to Yale because they have an endowment that was going to invest in one of our companies. And, um, they, they want to spend the day with you. They want to see your body language. They want to see everything, you know, your nervous twitches and everything. A lot of it's body language, and that's what they really are looking for. Your investors are going to want that with the tonality of you on the phone talking to them about these companies. That's great. Well, for everybody in the audience, if you have any further questions, you have Sal's email there. Please use it to ca catch up with him on this and also check out Calling the Capital. I found a very uh, helpful book. I learned a lot from it, and I think you will too as well. So I want to thank you for joining us today, and we're going to switch over to our presenters now. Love to hear your thoughts on them at the end. But with that, let's go ahead and bring our first presenter up, Vanessa, can, uh, another tomorrow. Vanessa barboni Halleck has a great deal for us to share today. And with that, Vanessa, I'll go and let you kick it off. Wonderful. So good to be here. Thank you very much for having me. You can hear me all right? Yes, we can. Okay, fantastic. Um, so Vanessa Barboni Halleck, I am the founder and CEO of Another Tomorrow, uh, which is an end-to-end -end, uh, digitized and sustainable apparel company and a platform for re-commerce. And uh, I actually cut my teeth, uh, not dissimilar from, from Sal here in banking. I was at Morgan Stanley for 15 years where I left as a managing director in, uh, in 2018. And I took a sabbatical basically with the idea of moving from emerging markets where I built a number of businesses from Morgan Stanley into ESG, uh, because I saw the promise of redirecting capital into businesses that were future relevant uh, and building the way that the, the, the future is moving. And uh, much to my surprise, uh, not too long into that moment, I fell completely down the rabbit hole of the huge magnitude of impact in the apparel industry. Uh, the enormous magnitude, the complexity of it, um, and really the utter lack of consumer facing solutions and corporate leadership. And so today um, I'm here to share our Series A opportunity with you. Uh, we're at the tail end of our raise, uh, only about $300,000 left out of 5 million. Um, and I'm excited to share what we're building. So driven by a really clear vision 
we are out to reinvent fashion in service of both our customer and the planet. This is a massive market, uh, $300 billion, $390 billion market, and it is a global environmental imperative. And we're doing this in four crucial ways. Number one, unlocking clothing as an asset, swinging that pendulum back from fast fashion where it's been for the last uh, roughly 20 years through sustainable, traceable, and transparent sourcing, through our best-in-class platform for e-commerce, and leveraging technology to transform this industry through digitized products that we use for consumer-facing transparency, product registration, and authentication. So we're just about three and a half years old, and we are a rapidly growing company, and really, I'm proud to say, a recognized leader in sustainability and innovation. You'll find us at the World Economic Forum. You'll find us uh, speaking at numerous conferences, uh, and that's because we've really been leading the way uh, for both the consumer and the industry. So last year we did uh, just under three and a half million in revenue. We're on track to do 10 million top line in 2023. We just had our first million dollar GMV month in April. And we've really been able to maintain this two to three X year over year growth rate ever since we launched. We've got pretty incredible global product market fit customers in over 40 countries. A lot of that really organic. Um, and again, we've leveraged technology, uh, full digitization since launch. And we were actually the first uh, B Corp in our space, which is, which is luxury. So who are we serving? Uh, we are serving a growing global mass affluent population um, of asp and aspirational customers for whom the conventional market is failing. And this is crucially important that we are serving the customer where they are, not where they want, where we want them to be. One of the things that I noticed early on in starting this business is that numerous founders wanted the customer to care more than they were willing to care, know more than they could possibly know, and be willing to pay more for an inferior product. Those three things fundamentally do not scale, and we don't rely on any of them. So where are the pain points for the customer today? Number one, the customer wants asset quality clothing, call it luxury clothing. It's very expensive. It's about three times contemporary prices. Two, it's a very, if you build it, they will come business. It doesn't often reflect functional or values um, of our core customer. And the big deal here is about 80% of purchases that we make were not worn in the past 12 months. So we've got tons of money stuck in our closets um, and it's difficult to resell. So that user experience is really, really painful. At the same time, this is a broken business model. So for anyone who is not historically invested in fashion, I say, great job, because historically it's been a really broken business. But the truth is um, what's been broken for the industry is also broken for the planet. And this take make waste approach has driven huge economic, social, and environmental costs. This really high risk model requires very high gross margins, race to the bottom in cost. Promotional activity and disposal of inventory fills landfills and is incredibly damaging to brand equity. And there's historically been very weak customer connectivity across the product life cycle. And a lot of that's due to really poor use of technology. So we're really addressing both in our unique business model. We're solving for these two challenges. And we live at this intersection of three high growth fashion submarkets. And we actually have a material price advantage versus the competition, which we consider to be traditional luxury. So what are we offering? A luxury quality product that is more accessible in price, rigorously sustainable, and fully circular, which allows us to reach a much bigger customer audience and deliver value for the customer where they are today, both through our primary price point and our secondary price point all the while reinventing the industry through this lens of system change and superior economics. So our business model is not just about sourcing, it's also about actually reducing risk in the system, increasing circularity, um, and overall uh, reducing waste as well. So how have we done this? Uh, well, we did it initially the hard way, but we've actually found an incredible way to scale this and reduce risk in the business. We've created a scalable farm to closet product life cycle. Uh, so fashion is kind of inherently an agricultural product that is sustainable, circular, transparent, and digital. Starting with the premise that the impact starts at the fiber level. So we've built our supply chains from the farm up. We've built incredible scalable partnerships to do that. We've got custom fabrics, best in class manufacturing that we are now moving into just in time. And at the end of the product cycle, every item gets its own unique digital ID, which we leverage for resale. 
So the result for the customer is a digitized modern wardrobe of exceptional quality at a compelling price, again, about half the price of conventional luxury that our customer can treat as an asset and it offers us very high efficiency as a business. So in my former life as a trader gave me a very strong lens on risk. This is a merchandising mix that, mix that is very highly risk managed because we've got almost entirely product market fit and it's all about efficiency in marketing, distribution, and inventory management. So crucially, every single product is born with its own unique digital ID. This is highly differentiating technology infrastructure. Then we have three live use cases today. So if anyone has their mobile phone out, I rarely suggest that you do this during a presentation, but feel free to scan that QR code in the upper right-hand corner. And you can see the connected products experience that is live today. So one of the things that you'll find is our authenticated resale platform. So if you click on resell this item, you'll see how incredibly easy it is to actually resell this product. You can click on that, you can put in the product condition, you'll know exactly how much it's gonna sell for and what your cut of the proceeds is. This is really a best in class pro, uh, program and it's known for that across the industry. And now that it's been live for about a year, we have recognized incredible benefits, both in terms of customer lifecycle, maximizing that, making sure that the customer is reselling that product and repurchasing, accessing that new younger customer. About 60% of customers are now experiencing a new brand in a pre-love format. So it's incredible from that standpoint and having the ability to connect to the product or to the customer through the end product, irrespective of point of sale. Now, the beautiful thing in all of this is that we've uncovered incredible learnings and we've now started to develop a SaaS tool that unlocks even further opportunity for circularity and benefits on both the economics um, and the impact side. We're doing this in two ways, leveraging this digital ID uh, for product registration to build that first party data relationship and matching together buyers and sellers. Uh, so somebody pointed out to me the other day that only a former trader would have thought about that in the resale market. And I suppose that's true, but we've really recognized that there's a point of friction for the seller where we're busy, you know, those clothes are sitting in your closet, you're not thinking about reselling them. Whereas the buyer has really high purchase intent. And so we're building out what we're calling the product wallet. And as part of that, a customer can request any product we've ever made out of our archive and anyone who's ever purchased it gets a notification on their cell phone. Uh, this is pretty revolutionary. We need it for our business. Another tomorrow is going to be client number one of this MVP. But ultimately, the goal here is to end up uh, offering this as a licensing uh, license tool on a white label basis to other brands. So the sky's really the limit here. So overall, as I mentioned, we're a really fast growing brand in a very large market. Uh, the personal luxury goods market is a $390 billion market. The resale market last year hit $100 billion alone, and it's growing about 10 times the size of the conventional market. We've really established new standards of excellence across the board. We've got killer sales uh, pipeline really underpinned by a very strong omni-channel approach. That's what's leading us to about 3X growth this year, which is clearly in sight and a strong pipeline into next year. We've got incredible margins, um, over 65% gross landed going to 70 come August. Um, we've got a great diversified revenue mix, very capital efficient inventory and resale model and a lot of tech optionality. Incredible global market segment. Um, again, 40 customers in 40 countries, really high AOV. It's actually over $1,000 now and a very high retention rate, three times the luxury average. And some incredible existing partners. So we're selling product through the best of the best. Neiman Marcus, Bergdorf Goodman, Saks Fifth Avenue, Net-A-Porter, Mattress Fashion, Farfetch, you name it. And we've got a bunch more coming live uh, this fall. And we've had killer press. So New York Times launch story, British Vogue feature, Bloomberg profile, and we've actually really been able to maintain this cadence throughout our three years, which is really unusual as a brand, because usually it's a flash in the pan when you launch, and then it dies out. And because we've really continued to lead for both the consumer and the industry across innovation, product, and sustainability, we've been top of mind across the board. So we've got a killer team of domain experts. Um, a couple of recent hires, our SVP of marketing comes from a venture-backed D2C travel company, also you know, very seasoned in the luxury space out of Tiffany's. Uh, same thing with our creative director. COO has scaled businesses to over 100 million in revenue, over 100 people. It's a very strong team and a very robust list of advisors 
across technology supply chain, you're going to recognize Microsoft, Patagonia, uh, Calvin Klein, Christie's, Google, uh, Warby Parker, you name it. And we've really leapfrogged the incumbents to establish very difficult to replicate credibility in technology infrastructure. So again, it's a 5 million Series A. We have 300,000 left, um, three key milestones, 10 million in revenue end of this year, inflection point to profitability, second quarter of next year, MVP of what we're calling the product wallet that really unlocks that tech optionality. Um, and we really are very, very focused on um, being relevant to potential acquirers. So these are long, long sales cycles, much longer than your traditional investor. And if you look on the left side of this, um, these are basically your major luxury conglomerates. Karen, I've been building a relationship with for the last two years, owner of Gucci, Balenciaga, seeing them for lunch in uh, two weeks, LVMH, uh, needs no introduction, seeing them for drinks in two weeks in Paris. No, Richemont recently met with one of the board members from Xenia, the former CEO of, of Ferragamo, um, and we're very relevant for their portfolios. Um, we have what they need in terms of sustainability. We have what they need in terms of nimbleness and in, uh, innovation, um, and we have what they need in terms of a very future relevant brand um, for their customer. So really excited to offer you the opportunity to invest in the transformation of truly one of the largest and most impactful industries on this planet. Um, and from there, I will be happy to pause and take a couple questions. Great, Vanessa, thanks for that. For those in the audience, if you would like to post any questions, we'll do our best to answer them. And we will run a poll. So if you are interested to learn more, you can just reply to that poll that will run in just a few moments. Sal, what questions did you have? I have one question just as it relates to um, the supply chain, the just in time. Are we back now with that? Is that something that I mean, obviously, you know the business, but like, you know, is is that something where the disruptions for the supply chain have now been cleared? You know, it's interesting. In in fashion, barely anyone has actually attempted just in time manufacturing. Uh, it's it's fairly sad. I would say that supply chains have definitely normalized. Um, so that's that's a real positive. But what we're doing is we're basically taking like what the automotive industry figured out decades ago and bringing it into fashion. And we're doing this specifically in Portugal. Um, where there's a really high level of technology and innovation, and it's perfect for our supply chain because we leverage these like core custom fabrics. But yeah, by and large, I would say the supply chain kinks are out. Ours actually experienced almost no disruption whatsoever during COVID, with the exception of just that brief uh, kind of March, April initial period when everything truly shut down. Okay, good. Yeah, it seems like that part of the country is rich for fashion billionaires such as Zara, right? Or Indeed. Armando Ortega. Yeah, I follow his uh, real estate stuff. So it's pretty interesting. Thank you. you got it. Great. My question, Vanessa, is you're using data quite a bit throughout your system. Is there a data play here for monetizing the data outside your internal process? Yeah, such a good question. I mean, what, what we see is really like the, the B2B opportunity here is really around digitized products, um, which is something that can be leveraged for any consumer product that retains its value, right? So what we're calling this circular CRM, this product wallet, um, where we see the opportunity is really how you manage this new circular customer life cycle from having that first party data relationship, even in an omni-channel construct where the brand can have that direct relationship with the customer, and then really being able to manage that entire customer life cycle through selling that item, potentially purchasing secondhand items, um, that's really what we see. There's actually a really interesting potential insurance play here. Um, and, and that's because actually, actually, if you have these kind of product wallets where customers are actually registering their product, um, that's a ton of information that was never in existence previously around an individual's um, actual asset purchases, you know, whether they're consumer goods or otherwise. Um, but I would think that's more the play than data, if I'm really honest. Have you talked to any insurance carriers about this and they expressed interest in that? You know, we have not directly, but it's uh, we've had a lot of people banging down the door on the tech piece specifically, and specifically those actually in fintech where they really see uh, the promise of treating consumer goods as assets. And it's actually something that's come up as a potential exit on the technology platform side specifically, uh, because it's something that insurance companies have lacked uh, historically. And they know because, you know, they've got them as LPs. Great. Well, thanks so much for that, Vanessa. Appreciate it. And uh, we'll be back in touch with the interest that we get from the, the presentations today. And with that, we'll switch over to Matt Smentik of uh, Unchained Systems. With that, uh, Matt, go ahead and kick it off. 
Thank you, Hall. Can you see my screen and hear me okay? Yes, we can. Hear you fine. You're good to go. Great. Well, I'm Matt. I'm the co-founder of Unchained Systems, where we've combined our expertise in the grooming business with software product development to solve the issues that are inhibiting the personal services industry. Our mission is to empower personal services businesses to thrive. My wife and I are multi-unit franchisee owners of Diesel Barbershop in Austin, Texas. Here's the problem. The customer experience for online call-in and walk-in appointments is antiquated. Booking a first-time appointment, I uh, have to uh, input data or click up to 20, 29 times. Customers are expecting a 24 by 7 digital booking solution with a modern UI that works, but they're not getting it. We need one tool for reporting, analytics, scheduling, and labor management, but that's a deficit. The key focus is there's not a world-class platform for franchisors and multi-store owners. While there's been major advances in fintech and restaurant and delivery services, personal services has been neglected. All those stakeholders are currently underwhelmed. So you think about the employees, managers, customers, and owners, they're all, uh, they're all at a deficit based upon the systems today. Our solution is called Amplify by Unchained Systems. It's a superior experience for clients, employees, store owners, and franchisors. And at the heart of the system is a purpose-built point-of-sale customer relationship management solution, uh, which we consider a vertical SaaS platform. A few call-outs here is a seamless brand and booking website look and feel. So I think what Squarespace has done and apply that to the personal services category. Quick and easy registration and online booking, similar to OpenTable and Resi. Uh, and a quick and easy customer checkout, inventory management, and scheduling solution. Think of what Toast has done for the restaurant category. This is an operating system for franchisors, franchisees, and multi-store owners. Here's our current status. We've got 60% of the tech stack completed. Uh, roadmap going out several years. Uh, a key, couple of key callouts here. So we just turned on online booking in January, and here's the uh, at the test store. This is the customer growth uh, for the store over the last four months. <clears throat> and additionally, we started to uh, work with Google to implement Google Ads conversion tracking, um, which. I don't think has really been done in this industry before. So as long as the customer acquisition cost is below lifetime value, you would do that deal. Um, we've been able to prove that out with numbers, at least for the first four months, and it's having a, a great effect. And the average spend is coming down per customer acquisition at the store. Uh, if you took a look at the total addressable market based on IBIS world numbers, uh, $7 billion market uh, based upon the total locations times our revenue per seat. You look at the SAM, it's about 400 million and look at just 3% of the US market. Uh, it's about a $40 million business out to 2029. Our first customer is us. So the chairman of uh, Unchained System is also the decision-making platform for his three brands, which consist of 32 open barbershops across the United States. Six additional stores are in construction and Diesel has sold licenses for 115 locations that are scheduled to open by 2027. Uh, two of the brands have not started franchising, but Henley's will start to uh, franchise later this year. And our second customer is called Premier Cuts. They've been in business for 18 years. Uh, there's five locations in Central Texas. So this brings our total store count to 43 without any sales and marketing. Our uh, go-to-market plan is to initially capture the SaaS uh, solution um, by coming in at a competitive price point. We plan to expand the offering through product-led growth, particularly some AI co-pilots for scheduling and labor management and inventory management. And ultimately, we plan to extend into some fintech tools, including uh, same-day payout loans for employees, bridge loans for, for owners, and ultimately franchisees. Our current business model is $250 per month for the core SaaS platform. We're collecting 30 basis points on credit card processing transactions, which is 90 to 95% of uh, business, as well as making three cents on uh, text messages for reminders. At the test store, we're banking $432 per month for the last two months. 
<clears throat> Again, I talked about future product expansions, uh, early tip payouts. We're expecting that in Q1 next year. Q2 is some AI co-pilots for uh, scheduling and labor management. Um, we plan to use this raise to get us the 300,000 in ARR for the built-in stores without any sales and marketing. And going out to 2029, we see 2,000 locations on our platform at roughly $40 million in top-line revenue. Our team is Shane Brown. He's the chairman of Men's Grooming Concepts, which includes Diesel, Henley's, and Cowboy Up. He also has a CPG brand. I'm the co-founder and spent 25 years developing systems and products, including the last 11 at Apple, where I developed omni-channel programs that are used by millions of people. Again, my wife and I are also multi-store owners of Diesel Barbershop franchisees, so we're going to be eating our own dog food. Uh, Parashah Shah heads product and engineering. He's had two, uh, two exits with uh, other venture-backed startups. And to summarize, we're a reoccurring revenue vertical SaaS solution powering the original reoccurring revenue business, haircuts. We're targeted at franchisors and multi-store owners. We're extendable into other adjacencies over time. And think of us as a vertical SaaS or fintech investment, we're raising $2 million on a $10 million valuation cap. And we plan to raise a Series A in 2024 after we cut over our initial stores. With that, I will take any questions. Great. If you have any questions in the audience, please post it in the chat box. My first question is, you have three revenue streams. What percent of your revenue is going to come from each of those? Or, or even better, what exactly is the one that's going to actually carry the day of, of those three? Uh, good question. So the core SaaS model is $250 per month per seat. Um, <clears throat> so that's, I would say, the majority of it. The credit card processing transaction is based upon the revenue of the store. Again, roughly... 90 to 95% of the cards are uh, the revenues and credit cards versus cash. Um, so we're seeing roughly $100 a month in revenue here. And then SMS text messages, these are essentially the reminders of your appointments. Um, this is a variable as well. We're seeing about $100 there. So I'd say it's uh, roughly 60% and then 2020. Great. My second question is, you're going after franchises and franchisee locations. Uh, what percent of the market is that, and how far will that get you if you cover all franchises bef you know, before you have to go to other, other models? Yeah, just in like the hair and adjacent personal services businesses, it's roughly 30,000 locations across the United States. Um, that would be hair and massage. That doesn't even include nails and some of the other categories. So uh, what we see is that the small operators do not run efficient business. And for instance, Shane, he acquired the Cowboy Up stores uh, through another um, owner operator that just was not profitable. And so he took those over, implemented his essentially management system, and now they're running profitably. When we move that over from the incumbent platform to Unchained, we should unlock additional uh, both customer acquisition as well as running a more efficient business. And so I think there's going to be a big consolidation in this market over time because the bigger players will just be that much more profitable. Great. You talk about in implementing AI. How do you see AI uh, impacting the business? Where can it be leveraged? Great question. So um, the first area, my wife spends six to eight hours a month on scheduling, which is shocking for each of the stores. We have two right now. We'll have six. Um, it should be my goal to her is to get it down to 15 minutes. So if you think about it as a constraint problem, you've got your store hours, you've got your uh, staff availability, and you have your historical run rates and your future bookings. Um, <clears throat> some of those, at least in the, the men's market, are going to be same day or bookings within 24 hours. And so once you start accumulating some data here, uh, you can even, I mean, even today with the rudimentary chat GPT and some of the other tools, you can start to predict uh, what uh, demand could look like and adjust your staffing accordingly. Um, so that's number one. Number two is on labor management. So after your staff for the day, uh, and labor being your number one cost, let's say it's 2 p.m., you're open till 8. Uh, if you are not managing the books correctly, uh, and there is um, staff that are not booked, you know, we, we envision a scenario where 
the owner or the manager gets a text message, you know, you should add labor, cut labor, maintain labor, run a promotion, uh, you know, give a free nose wax, something like that, that would um, potentially add on future revenue. So these are some of the quick, quick win areas that we see. That's great. Is there a data play here somewhere? Similarly to what you're talking with Vanessa, I, I think there is. I don't know until we, you know, accumulate enough of that data. Um, I got to guess that this would be with the whole uh, large language models that over time having the retail data that's kind of toughest for some of these big players to get access to could become important. But how that actually translates, I still have not predicted the future. What gates your ability to roll out to new uh, franchises? Is it the signing up the franchise? Is it implementing? Is it training people? What's the, the bottleneck? Uh, so we've not gone to market yet. We're focusing on getting the product right for ourselves first. But the the play would be to go to the franchisor, show, you know, Shane has got 13 years in this business. So he's got a lot of credibility. We have this problem. We solve this problem for ourselves you know, would you consider trying it out? And they would probably run, run it in one or two of their locations before committing. Um, <clears throat> each of the incumbent platforms, there's usually not a great way to import the data in. So there's a one-time activity for us to map the data from the old system to the new system, but there's roughly three to seven key players that we'd have to do that once. So it'll probably take us, you know, 20 to $30,000 to do a one-time mapping activity and after we complete those seven we probably wouldn't have to do that ever again so if i were to onboard a 50 store chain how fast can you get that up and running and producing revenue for, for, for an existing chain it probably yeah. takes two months to do that but for the first time once we've already done the data mapping it would be literally a probably a day activity um in terms of the data mapping migration process right I see you have a fintech model in there as well. Can you tell us more about the the take rate on the fintech piece? What, how much are you getting from each one, and how does that impact the the, the cost or the price to the customer? So we've not done anything with fintech to date, outside of getting the text uh, revenue from the text messages. So what we plan to be able to do, uh, and, and very you know close to home example during COVID, we needed a um, a working capital loan from our from our bank. Uh, even with my great credit and uh, uh, good relationship with the bank, it took close to six weeks to get a $25,000 loan. Um, and so once you're sitting on all this data, we imagine creating relationships with several banks. And if you are either a stylist or a shop owner or a franchisor and need one of these working capital loans, the CRM part of the solution has all the historical data as well as the future bookings. And so if they would opt into that with the relationship that we have, we could turn that on and they could probably get qualified within 24 hours or less. Um, and we would take a, a finder's fee for, for such a market making activity. Have you looked at buy now, pay later methods of doing this? Um, BNPL, at least in the men's market, probably doesn't make sense because you're at a 40 to $100 price point. I think once you go into the women's market where it's $250 for a cut and color, uh, that's absolutely something that we would, you know, take a look at as we move into the, the female oriented market. Great. Can you tell us more about the, uh, the terms of the deal and how much, uh, you know, what, what you're going to do with the funds? Yeah. So raising $2 million at a $10 million valuation cap. Uh, the key outcomes there is to get to uh, 300,000 in ARR. So we have to build out the rest of the capabilities on our platform. Um, we've got a third party dev shop as well as bring on some uh, local resources here in the US uh, to manage that team. And uh, that's kind of the, the, the key to the, to the 2 million. Great, well, how best for people to get back in touch with you? Uh, you can reach out through Hall or directly at matt at unchainedsystems.com. But thank you so much for everybody's time and appreciate the opportunity. Great. Thanks, Matt. I think that brings us to the end of our presentation today. I want to thank uh, Matt and Sal and Vanessa for doing presentations. Many great comments there in the chat box as well. I want to thank the audience. Appreciate you guys showing up today. We'll be back with another event soon with great more great speakers and so forth. 
Uh, if anybody in the audience has questions, feel free to reach out to us, and we're glad to connect you with anybody that you saw today, and then we're glad to answer any questions you have about fundraising or investing in startups. With that, we're going to close it out, and want to thank everybody for joining us, and we'll see you guys next time. Have a good one. Thank you.